Coming to you live from hour 22 of WDWNT's Toys for Tots Marathon, this is Park Center. Hello there, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Park Center. Joining me, I have Ashley. Hello. And Jill. Welcome to the deep. Yeah. And a couple newcomers. Hello to Ron. Hello. And Patrick. Hey. Okay, fine. I'll say it. Siva <laughs> Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Someone had to do it. It was missing. We can't start a show without it now. All right. So uh, let's let's start off with uh, our first topic for the night. A, a bit of a talk about uh, some changes coming to Snow White's Scary Adventures. Uh, there is theoretically a, a new happily ever after ending coming. Some, uh, I guess, dulling down of the scaring. Uh, this, I, this attraction always scared me far more than I thought it should have. And I'm, I'm kind of okay with, with toning it down a little bit. And I think I might be in the minority when I say that. I'm very curious to hear what other people have to say about this. Um, this is one of my big regrets. When I first became a Disney Parks fan, I did not ride this attraction on my first visit. And then by the next time it was gone... So I have no point of reference for how scary it is personally, but when you take on an attraction like this, there is always going to be a lot of fear, especially when you're talking about new scenes. I was having a conversation with a friend who is not exactly a Parks fan, but he said to me that basically everything is just a motion simulator now. If this comes with really great state-of-the-art uh, audio animatronics, I'm all for it. Yeah, I don't think state-of-the-art animatronics is what's going to happen here. But I know. I've, you know. These are quaint. They've always been quaint, and the movie has a happy ending. I don't see why it's going to be an issue if the ride has a happy ending. As long as they don't remove the witch entirely, uh, there are still moments from that movie that should be scary. So as long as there's something scary in the ride, it doesn't need to be you know, a Horror Nights house. Yeah, I think I it's, it's a shame to me. Oh, go ahead, Ashley. Oh, I was just going to say, I agree with that. But there is something nice about it being one of the classic dark rides. I don't want another Frozen or even another Little Mermaid. I want it to stay, especially in Disneyland since it is gone, I want it to stay one of the quintessential Fantasyland rides. And I think that it should. I think they can switch out the scenes and keep the charm. And I think if they upgrade it too much, it's going to lose a lot of that. And then if it does, I think it stays will be numbered because people just won't won't go anymore. Yeah, I totally agree. I Again, this is an opening day Disneyland attraction. So there's a lot of, uh, I guess, baggage attached to that for a <laughs> ride. That, you know, you've got a Walt original, you've got something that opened the park. And I think a lot of people aren't going to want to see this change. I personally love these old classic dark rides. I hate that they're gradually going away. I think that um, it's a shame that they're refurbing this because it's almost like if you're going to change it that substantially, then why even keep it? You know, uh, they're not they're not putting state of the art animatronics in it. Unfortunately, I won't be surprised if we see some screens replacing scenes at the end, which is going to be a bummer to see. Such a screen-based attraction, like them turning a, a Disneyland classic into a screen-based attraction, that that will break my heart. And mm -hmm. I don't mean this, but I almost want to say, if you're gonna change it that radically, then just get rid of it. Like, don't yeah. don't sanitize. It. And the other thing that frustrates me about this is like Disney movies get dark, trying to be like, oh, it needs to all be happy ending and blah blah blah. Like. Especially like Snow White got really dark. Lots of, especially the old Disney movies on which most of these uh, these dark rides were based, were really kind of freaky in parts. So why do you need you don't you're not going to sanitize the movie? So why are you going to sanitize the ride? Mm -hmm. Be like doing a, a Willy Wonka attraction without the boat scene. Oh know? my god! I totally yeah. agree with you, Jill. Totally agree with you. You couldn't do that. On but the other hand. I think Jill very point that has me concerned though because if they do upgrade it again 
if its days are numbered, then you've got to figure Peter Pan, Pinocchio, all of those other ones, especially out of Disney Storybook Canal, all of days are going to be numbered too. And I sincerely that they're not planning to gut Fantasyland because I mean, even Toad out there, all of them, if you change one for the sake of upgrades and things like that, you may, you're going to want to change them all. And I'm going to play devil's advocate here and just say this ride has been changed multiple times over the years and mm-hmm. on both coasts before it was removed here. And let's not forget, this isn't the 1955 ride. That's gone. This is the oh, 1982 yeah. ride. Um, it is a classic. It has to be there in some iteration. And I think as long as there is some iteration of a Snow White dark ride, it is still a quintessential fantasy land ride. It doesn't need to be the scary ride because, you know, it got changed when Snow White got put in. It got made scary and unscary and scary back in Florida. It's... Yeah. There's a soul to the ride that none of those will change. Okay, I'm just yeah. going to say this to you, Ron, about that statement exactly, in terms mm-hmm. of just because you change some of it, it's still there. Uh, journey into imagination. Do it! <laughs> oh. <laughs> yep, yeah. That's, that's a fair point. Mm. Now we're all so sad. I, I don't yeah. think that's true. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but that's a, that's a totally valid point to make here. That, that that you don't want this turning into something like that, where it's just a husk of its former self. But, exactly. No, that's, at the same time, if they just upgrade they're... stuff, it could be good. But I guess they that strip the imagination of it's necessary. Oh. Much like imagination, it wasn't necessary with that. Why? Are... Mm-hmm. I don't think it's necessary now either, and that's, that's what fair. has me worried. All right, before we move into our next topic, uh, we are going to be talking about Rise of the Resistance and in a spoilery fashion. Uh, so if you folks are not interested in hearing us talk about those spoilers, uh, please please mute for about the next, let's see, about six <laughs> minutes or so. All right, three, two, one. All right, I gave you fair warning. Uh, so we have gotten a lot of preview footage uh, from the queue, from the ride itself, uh, like this is, I, I do not remember the last time Disney like air quotes leaked this much about a new attraction uh, that we didn't already know uh, or hadn't already seen. I guess uh, th- this this inside look is just so good. Like there are so many things that you get to see in here. Uh, like yes, there are some stormtroopers on screens, but there are also a ton of animatronics here. I like the stormtrooper room that we've seen about 20 times by now. Uh, but just look, looking at all these details, this looks amazing. Um, does anybody else want to gush about this? Or does anybody like have any problems with what we've seen so far? No problems. I just think as much as they've revealed, it proves the point that they know that attendance is down from what they projected. And they want to make sure that people show up. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Quick, quick question for me. Uh, so in this in this shot, we see folks like standing in the stormtrooper room. Uh, is this something that they got to do because they're special people, or is this something that we're all going to get to do? My understanding is that this is kind of the holding room between the sections of the ride, from what I remember reading. So when you deboard the simulator section, and you're being walked around by imperial officers this is where that scene happens that's so cool um, so oh, that yeah this is like the holding area for this is like the mid queue nice I guess is the best way to say it mid queue huh yeah i mean we haven't really had an attraction where we've had a ride then a queue then the rest of the ride before so that that makes sense i think i, I said it, it before this real show that like, mm-hmm. I feel like it's something that's kind of a major feature or a major differentiator in terms of a Disney attraction. I think it's weird that they didn't tell us anything. Like, they showed us so much and they didn't show anything about that. Well, they, they, have, been, they have been bragging a little bit about that. They, they've gone on a few times about how this has four different ride systems in it. Um, and the, that's kind of a massive achievement in and of itself. So I, I suppose... Though that the they don't want to necessarily be hyping up the fact that you have to wait twice for the whole attraction. <laughs> Maybe that's it. 
That's fair. I mean, there's plenty of times you wait for the pre-show, see the pre-show, and then get and wait again. I mean, Mansion's a classic yeah. example of that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. but, but something like that this, where there's a whole kind of thing where you s- slide between things, really reminds me of the old Star Trek experience in Vegas. Yes. Um, where you would have, there was some sort of intro, then the Borg attacked, and then they, like, walk you through an interactive scene with, like, Borg walking down the hallway as you get to the simulator. So it's something other people have done that apparently failed or just, you know, wasn't the right spot for it. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is, on a scale, you know, way beyond that. This There's, what, supposedly one room in this attraction that's the size of Pirates of the Caribbean? Wow. That's oh my gosh! That's Whoa. an entire jeez. I I remember hearing that. I don't know if it's this hangar scene or it's the at at scene. I like, yeah, I can see either of those. Yeah, yeah there's supposed to be a massive Walmart sized kind of room in here jeez. somewhere. Here's there's the one the, thing the I'm thing? afraid of. Yeah. I was going to say the one thing I'm afraid of with what they showed is the scene where you're in the sort of. I, I guess it's sort of like a personnel transport where you're going through and the, you're underneath the adats and all of that. I guess I don't know how how exciting is a personnel transport to ride in like a <laughs> dramatic chase scene. That's like, fair. This this gives me shades of Fast and the Furious at Universal, no, where it's no. like you've got oh. this amazing IP themed around race cars, and the ride is in a bus. You know. Like, I just, <laughs> I, I, doesn't have that feeling to it because when I when I wrote Fast and the Furious, that was all I kept saying is what a missed opportunity this is that you have this franchise and you around cars and you put people mm-hmm. in a bus. So I hope that it doesn't have this sort of underwhelming vibe because you're riding in this little transport thing that can't possibly be designed to go very fast or, you know, handle very well. Yeah. Well, this isn't going to be waiting. a linear line. Like mm-hmm. the the bus transport just goes in a line, yeah. And so, I mean, this obviously can move. So it's it's a trackless track system. Right? So yeah. So we don't know. Like you might be going in and out of their legs for all we really know. Oh, that'd be awesome. With with the spoilers, we still didn't get the spoiler on the one thing that I'm actually really looking for. And what is the level of the interactivity going to be? Yeah, I see these stormtroopers mm-hmm. shooting there. Are we going to shoot back or are we just passive in this ride? We've talked a lot of times at this network. One of the big differences between Disney attractions and Universal attractions is you're a more active participant in a Disney attraction. I don't want to just go on there and have this happening around me and not being able to affect my environment. Yeah. I, I really I hope that there's a lot of the about. interaction. I'm sorry, what? I don't I don't think you will. I think um, Millennium, Smuggler's Run was the interactive one. I think this is going to be more passive. Yeah. The way that they've described it, unfortunately, which makes me sad, but they haven't said anything about interacting with anything, and I feel like that would they would be selling that if it were going to happen. Yeah, that's fair. But then again, they haven't told us really, like, directly much about this attraction at this point. Um, well... All right, uh, folks who were not uh, paying attention before now, welcome back. Uh, We are out of spoiler territory, but we are going to talk a little bit more about Rise of the Resistance. I swear it's not spoilery, though. Uh, And Jar Jar came out of nowhere. Uh, Oh, my gosh. Could you believe that? (laughs) Misa in the new run, Annie. (laughs) Misa all sparkly glowy. Uh, So Rise of the Resistance is going to be excluded from Extra Magic Hours uh, at Hollywood Studios, which I... I'm just going to immediately throw this back to people. Uh, why? Why is th- why is this the case? Why would you do this? Because it's a technical nightmare. We've seen that with the delays. Uh, we've heard about all the problems with this, and we've seen new ride si- new ride systems having issues with Hagrid's over at Universal that they have to cut the ride uh, times down that it wasn't opening on time or closing early. And I think. For the, at least for the time being, that's what this is. Is They're not sure everything's going to work, and they want to give it as much maintenance time as possible mm-hmm. rather than have it be extended out. And that also makes me scared of how quickly our effects going to start getting turned off in this thing. 
Ooh, oh, man. yeah. This has been depressing. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> yeah. Like that, that's so that's something to think about. Yeah. Like that that's a really yeah, solid point though. Like we we don't have multiple tracks here. We don't have a lot of like duplication of uh contents like we do in a lot of other attractions. Like with Flight of Passage, if one simulator goes down, we've got three more. Uh if, in Smuggler's Run, we've got something like what eight times four thirty two pods that are all independent. Uh, th if one goes down, then we've still got a bunch of capacity. I think with this, there are a few points where if things go wrong, they, they might just have to shut the whole thing down just by design. And that's kind of terrifying. I hope I'm wrong. I hope so. And hopefully yeah, there's B modes. Option. Yeah, B modes for everything. Yeah. I think this is going to be the Hagrids of Disney. Yeah, that's a, yeah. a good comparison. But even from an ops perspective, it's going to be a nightmare because during magic hours, everybody's going to go ride everything else and then get in line for this because they know it's. Or they're going to, they're going to go in line. And, gonna wait. and just get in line, so they're the first people in line. Mm -hmm. I think that's and probably pretty likely open. for at least a good group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then what happens like if the park opens at nine? What if? What if this isn't ready to open, you know, and you've got people standing there? I think this is definitely going to be an ops nightmare and, and uh, cast members are going to be given out a whole lot of free fast passes because people are going to be angry that either they waited in line for three hours and the ride went down or they showed up and waited in line and it just doesn't open forever. So yep. I, I feel like this is going to be not fun for the cast members working it. Now, here's an interesting question now. Is it not just going to be open for extra magic hours or when they start doing the paid uh, after hours oh, or yeah. early morning magic wow. things? Will it be closed for that? Or are they going to go, you know what? We'll get it open on time for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my I gosh. That is a dirty trick. It is. It wouldn't surprise me, but I would almost be willing to it if they're that concerned for the first couple weeks at least they won't chance it until they know it works. But once they get a little bit more reliability, I think they'll start rolling that out. It, that, I mean, because you're going to be even more trouble you sell tickets and it doesn't work. Extra tickets. Yeah, that's a have we point. had Have we had any extra ma or early morning magics or after hours things at the studios since Star Wars Land opened at all? Yeah, wasn't there something in the October? Yeah, they have 6 a.m. EMH every yeah. day since it's No, not the, not the extra yeah. magic no, the paid hours. Ones. The paid ones. I thought they had one. Oh, I thought they hours? had one. Yeah. Yeah, I think they've had one, maybe two. And Because they seem to remember yeah, us like as saying it wasn't particularly worth it. But <laughs> um, mo Moving on to other things that may not necessarily be worth it. Uh, Space 220. <laughs> uh <laughs> So, Space 220 has been having some uh, launch issues, uh, to say the least. Uh, first, their head chef quit on them. Uh, now we're looking at an early 2020 opening that has been confirmed in uh, the guide map uh, at, for Epcot at this point. Uh, we believe it to be February. Uh, that information is coming from, I believe, job listings and other descriptions that have stated uh, it plans to launch in February 2020 and that we're looking for people to join our crew and start training in January. Uh, so there is strong reason to believe that we've got another, what, two to three months before this thing opens. Uh, this, this, this place seems cursed to me. Like, this has just been, like, let's let's just keep having it fail and i don't want that i want to see this succeed it seems like a neat concept i think that the whole thing was done just so they can open on february 20th uh just or february oh 2020. oh no <laughs> the 220 2020 no no mm -hmm. well, I mean, if you're gonna wind up being delayed why not uh, yeah i guess yeah. but why? If they they should have just planned that the whole time. Honestly, I think that gag is worth waiting for. <laughs> this is such a a scary thing that's going on with this. When a head chef quits a restaurant, it's usually not a sign that things are going well. And there's so much amazing dining at Epcot. It's like it has to be so much atmosphere because clearly we're already getting the idea that it's not going to compete in the food and drink department. Yeah. Oh. 
on that note, he and did quit to take over to be the head chef of an entire resort in Vegas. So that is kind of a bigger mm -hmm. position than we're running one That's restaurant true. in Disney That's World. That's true. Didn't he leave from and that position, though? Yeah. He left? I don't know. Yeah, and then he came, and then he's going back. So yeah. maybe he wants to run a resort again. Maybe he wanted quality of life. We're only running one restaurant. I don't know. I have I mean, I've got plenty of restaurant experience, but not on that kind of scale. Um and well, restaurants get delayed opening, or maybe they were just pushing, trying to get open for the holidays, and then they just realized they were never going to make it. Ah, uh, and that could have been well, it I too. It, they might not have. It, I was just going to say, no, it's I, funny that they announced this in D twenty three. I mean, they announced an opening date for D twenty at D twenty three, which was not that long ago. So, and then the head chef quit. So, I think that's a big part of this delay. That. However, if they were supposed to open by the end of the year and all it took was replacing a head chef, I feel like all the way until February is a, a pretty long delay for that. So it seems like there might be some other issues going on here as well. Maybe it was pressure on him that to open early and all that that forced him to yeah. That's what, yeah. It, yeah. It could be all of this. Yeah, and we don't know if that's coming from Patina or Disney. Yeah. Uh, Ashley, were you saying mm -hmm. something or... Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I get it, if, but if he left the kind of job that he went back to, you typically don't do that, especially when you're close to opening. Like, it makes me wonder, and I think everybody's kind of right, I think there was either some pressure or some meddling that he just didn't want to deal with anymore, which doesn't bode well for the restaurant at all, that you essentially drove off your head chef. Yeah. Like that that's that's kind of a terrifying concept and does not bode well i'm hoping for the best but that just the optics there are terrible and i'm sure disney's it's weird too it. because patina has so much experience in disney world i mean this they is do. patina has so many other restaurants in epcot alone much less throughout the resort so it's odd that there's so many issues with this when patina of all people of all groups should know how to run open and run a disney restaurant I think Disney's meddling more in this than normally. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was going to say. I think they're meddling more because there's more atmosphere nonsense that they want, which is yeah. fair, but. Well, what one last topic for tonight, folks. Uh, Primeval World uh, is, is back. It's back. It is, it is back for, for a while, at least, until January 4th. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so it, it was closed for maintenance and then it kept being closed for maintenance and then it kept being closed for maintenance and they kept pushing back the opening just by weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks consistently kicking that can. And then eventually we have now got primeval world opening and open every day through January 4th at a minimum at this point. Um, I believe Disney did come out and say that this attraction is officially seasonal at this point. Uh, but I guess they they consider the uh, the Christmas season enough to justify its its opening. Um, is this really an attraction that like needs to be seasonal? Like, is what I honestly maybe I'm underestimating the manpower required to to run this ride on a day in day out basis. But I think it's something that they should just have open year round, right? This is a ride that's in every carnival in the country why can't the major theme park <laughs> Mon mongol mogul like disney keep this ride up and running it eats people away from other attractions it serves no other purpose if you're going to keep it closed just bulldoze it and make it easier to walk through that area a couple points one the company supposedly there is an exact copy of this and there's several other versions by a a European coaster manufacturer that no longer exists. So, and the other one that was supposedly like this supposedly went down at the same time for a while. Maybe they weren't able to get parts and they just were worried about that. Or, you know, maybe they didn't want to open this thing because it's literally killed two people already. Yep. Let's not forget that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they want this open, but I think, you know, at this point, maybe they were going to. And you know, tear it down and put something up, but the budget got cut, so they decided to bring it back at least seasonally. That's not unheard of. So mm. there's a lot that could be going on behind the scenes here that could involve Disney, could involve whatever this company is uh, that they can't get parts. They they know it's unsafe. Who knows? 
Mm-hmm. And it's unsafe for cast members, not guests. That that right, yeah, happens. it'd be perfectly clear. No, there hasn't, as far as I know, there hasn't been a major guest injury on here. There have been like the, st- the standard pre existing heart conditions and minor strains from the ride, but nothing unexpected. The two it'll, fatalities it'll... Were, were cast members in the unload zone, if I remember. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, at least one of those was somebody going somewhere that they really shouldn't have while the ride was on. So that's... Be careful, folks. These things can hurt. <laughs> I know we have at least some cast members that watch our stuff. Please please be careful. We care about you. <laughs> Observe lockout is... procedures. <laughs> I think this is going to go the way of Stitch's Great Escape. That it was seasonal operation, yep. and then it closed, and then whatever. And then it was... And actually, their last date was January 6th. So Ooh. this is slated until January fourth. A uh, little bit, not not completely Deja coincidence vu there, there, but yeah. But uh, I I kind of maybe they're they're pushing it through for the end of this year, and then you know maybe they can get some new budget next year. I I totally agree. I feel like this this can just go and get replaced with something else. I would be a hundred percent fine with. I'm I'm Literally far more upset anything. about. Yeah, I'm far more upset about Snow White changing in Disneyland than I am if they would just tear down Primeval World tomorrow. So Yeah. I, I, I want them to close Primeval World permanently and use the money they're saving from not running the attraction to fix the Yeti. Mm. Yes, please. Although they would need to not run the attraction <laughs> oh. for probably like 50 years to save enough money. To yeah, that's fair. Yeti. Yeah. Use some of the scrap metal to fix them. There we go. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, uh, thank you, folks, uh, for joining us this week on Park Center. Like I mentioned at the top of the show, we're doing this as part of uh, WDWNT's Toys for Tots Marathon Show. Uh, if you are hearing this, even even if it's after the the uh, the drive uh, the drive has officially ended, you can still donate. If you head on over to toys.wdwnt.com, uh, you can g- donate there uh, directly to Toys for Tots. We're not touching the money. There's no middlemen touching the money. Every cent you give goes straight to Toys for Tots, and you even have a an option there to cover the uh, transaction fees for credit cards and stuff like that. Toys for Tots has been a big part of the Walt Disney Company. Walt Disney himself actually helped design uh, the first Toys for Tots logo that had Donald Duck on it. Uh, and it's it's been a cause that's been uh, near and dear to his heart as and ours here for, uh, gosh, how many years have we been doing this now? I think it's over 10 that we've done this. Uh, so this is well, my ninth year. Okay, so it is it is at least the ninth year. <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry for not knowing that detail uh, but you can head on over to toys.wdwnt.com to donate there uh, and if you folks uh, want to head down to uh, Disney World to check out Primeval World, Space 220, anything like that, uh, we hi- highly recommend you check out Never Grow Up Vacations the official travel partner of WDWNT uh, they have many years of experience uh I'm sorry, 20 years of experience booking Disney vacations for their clients, and we're sure they can help you make your next trip even more magical. So head on over to wdwnt.travel to contact them about your next trip today. All right, folks, uh, we are going to have a uh, like a, a bit of a post show, I suppose, uh, since we're doing this live. Uh, we're going to have this live for everybody. So stick around after the show to uh, hang out with us and chat. Uh, normally, that's just for, for our Wigs members, but for, we'll give everyone a taste this week. Uh, so we will see you all in just a moment. Or if you're not sticking around live, we will see you next week. Da-da-da-da-da! <laughs>